Welcome to Cartoon Crusader, Arthur Schick's War Against Nazism. With this lecture, we honor Yom HaShoah, our, or Holocaust Remembrance Day, our annual commemoration of the Jews who perished in the Holocaust. This is an event of our monthly series, Flight of Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Stephen Lockhart is a senior program curator in the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. He served for 20 years as the curator of the museum's acclaimed permanent exhibition, The Holocaust. In addition, he curated eight special exhibitions, including The Art and Politics of Arthur Schick and State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. He has appeared in the following media outlets, CS Span, NCC, NBC Nightly News, Associated Press, Reuters International, History Detectives, The History Channel, Huffington Post, ZDF, German Television, PBS, Fox, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, National Geographic Channel, National Public Radio, Telemundo, Iran Vaya, Al Huara, The Atlantic, The Forward, Boston Globe, Cox News Service, USA Today, Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and TASS. Stephen Luckert received his PhD in Modern European History from the State University of New York at Binghamton and has published on German history, the Holocaust, and Nazi propaganda. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to commend you for the important work that you're doing. It, it's truly remarkable, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of this, this program. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about an artist that I've come to know and, and love, Arthur Schick. And, and for many of you, it's perhaps this is your first introduction to Arthur Schick, but Arthur Schick was a Polish Jewish artist who uh, was born in Łódź in 1894 and uh, was trained as an artist in Paris. Like many other Eastern European Jewish artists, he came there and he learned. And uh, for Schick, he, didn't de he developed a kind of a unique style that wasn't very modernist. I mean, he drew upon Persian miniatures from illuminated manuscripts from the past, but he came up with, some, with a style that was uniquely his own. But he was very much inspired by history. He was inspired by the heroism of, of, of the Jewish past. And what Schick did is try to convey a lot of his opinions in art. Now, Arthur Schick considered himself a propagandist. And by that he meant not as a purveyor of lies, but as someone who used art to carry a message. And I think we see that in all of Schick's work, whether it's his, the cartoons attacking Nazism, whether it is his Jewish art, his Haggadah, his Book of Job, his, uh, uh, his the two um, versions of the Book of Esther that he did, just a remarkable artist. And we were very fortunate enough to have uh, his daughter, Alexandra Bracey, donate a number of pieces to uh, the museum's collection. And that really has spurred on a lot of research. It, was, it served as one of the key backbones for our exhibition. And Alexandra was a, a wonderful individual, a remarkable storyteller who enlightened us all about her father and his work and so it's uh, uh, you know I'm indebted to her in so many different ways but let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, Schick's work attacking the Nazis. Now I took the title Cartoon Crusader from a newsreel that was done by, about Schick in about 1946 and it was called Cartoon Crusader and um, 
uh, kind of a remarkable piece that actually showed the artist, showed some of his work, and actually showed some of the changes that he made in some of his work. But Arthur Schick was a inveterate foe with the Nazis, and he was somebody who used his artwork, both the kind of um, intricate Jewish art that he did in the Haggadah to attack Nazism, as well as cartooning. Uh, uh, Arthur Schick was a, a remarkable remarkable individual in that he could do these very detailed drawings and artwork on particular things. But he was also a master of the art of cartooning, which are very different. Uh, cartoons are meant to get across an idea, a point very quickly for a mass audience. And Schick became quite a student that he actually began cartooning uh, at the time of the First World War. And, you know, on and off, he continued to do that throughout much of his life. But in the uh, 19, 1940s, uh, he became well known in the United States for his cartoons attacking Nazism and in support of the Allied war effort. Now I begin this photograph and this shows Arthur Schick and he's the one kind of standing with the vest and the glasses, uh, the kind of slight balding man uh, in the, uh, uh, to the side. And next to him is uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky, the Russian Jewish revisionist Zionist leader. Now their relationship was one of friendship and inspiration. Um, both were interested in conveying a very uh, strong image of the Jew to, to the world that kind of was aimed at combating this trope that Jews were cowardly and unwilling to fight. Both believed very much in the construction of this kind of new Jewish man, and both were dedicated Zionists. Um, Jabotinsky, of course, fell outside the mainstream of, of uh, the Zionist movement, uh, was much more militant, but they became, uh, they were lifelong friends. And um, in some ways, they also shared this notion during the Second World War of creating a Jewish army to fight against the Nazis. And in fact, Jabotinsky referred to Schick in one of his last works, and which he he talked about how they would have discussions about how the allies were kind of not, uh, where there was a kind of a conspiracy of silence against what was happening to the Jews. And he cited Sheikh as saying that, that they treated this issue as if it was pornography. That is, it was something that everybody knew existed but nobody wanted to talk about. And so what Schick tried to do in this artwork was try to bring public attention to what was happening to the Jews. And we're gonna see that in some of the, the upcoming pieces. Now, this piece was done in 1944. And I share this because this was um, the kind of frontispiece for a book that he did called Ink and Blood. And of course it plays on Bismarck's a statement about iron and blood, but in this case, it's Schick, you know, using his pen uh, to uh, to as a weapon. And you can see that Schick, you can see kind of a self portrait that Schick did of himself, and he's there at the at the ta at the table, trying to finish off Adolf Hitler. Now, this it, this is remarkable in in a number of ways. First, get, first of all, you get to see the kind of detail that Schick did, the use of colors, but also the ways in which he kept abreast of what was happening. So that you, if you see in the garbage can, <clears throat> this kind of waste bin that to hold all the, the waste bin of history, so to speak, you see Mussolini, uh, uh, Pétain, and uh, Pierre Laval in the, in the garbage can of history. They had at this stage, uh, Mussolini had been overturned. Uh, the French Vichy government had been uh, defeated and marked an end to it. Now Schick is trying to finish the job by defeating uh, Adolf Hitler, the Nazis, and the Japanese. This is a uh, Schick took uh, an, an interest in what was happening in the war. Uh, 
almost immediately and what was happening in Poland in particular. Uh, though he had lived in, in Paris and then in London and then in the United States, he never lost his, his love for his, for his home country of Poland. And he kept abreast of what was happening. This was a, an image that he did in 1939 in London that shows this, this caricature of, of Heinrich Himmler. And in his hand is a list of Poles and Jews that were to be ex executed. Now, what this refers to is the fact that the SS went into, into Poland and they had lists of individuals who were to be executed. And what we know is that as soon as they took over, as soon as they marched into Poland, SS units began killing off Polish intellectuals, uh, Jewish figures, etc. And so Schick is kind of alluding to this, the massacre of, of, it, of both Poles and Jews. Now Schick believed very early on that Nazi anti-Semitism was a very different, of a very different character than other types of anti-Semitism. That he saw that this was a kind of an exterminatory brand of anti-Semitism, that it aimed to destroy the Jewish people in its entirety. Now Schick uh, eventually left London, perhaps with the, the support of the British Ministry of of information to come to the New World to try to advocate for the Allied cause. At the time uh, when 1939 up until Pearl Harbor, the United States was neutral in the, in the war. And Schick tried to, in his effort to win uh, support for the Allied cause, did a lot of artwork for that cause. This was some a piece that he did in Canada. Uh, called the, the Painter and the Clipper. And it refers to Hitler as kind of this failed artist who's attempting to paint all of Europe black and spread death throughout the, throughout the continent. But you see the one lone um, enemy of Adolf Hitler about to snap, about to cut that, uh, uh, the, the rope that's holding up his scaffold. So without showing the British, except as the, um, the show the, the British Isles and these shears coming out from it, he is applauding the efforts of, of the British to fight against the, against, uh, fight ag alone against the Nazi threat. Now these were the two pieces that Schick did in 1941. And they both deal with two prominent leaders of the America First movement, Gerald P. Nye, Senator from North Dakota, and Charles Lindbergh, the famed aviator, uh, who became the, uh, among the key leaders of the uh, America First movement. But what Schick is doing here is identifying them as Nazis. And it, in part, this is drawn from two different, uh, two different things. If we look at the image of Lindbergh on the, the right, and you see that Charles Lindbergh is standing, he's like Nye, he's bedecked in all kinds of Nazi medals. And he's also, he's also, it shows him, you know, he's carrying a, a book, a Sein Kampf, a play on Mein Kampf, meaning in this case, his struggle. And if you look in the back, it's this notion that, that Lindbergh is dreaming of a new Nazi America. And then there's even a Nazi America newspaper uh, that, uh, and if you look at the bottom, and it's, it's some of these things, details are very hard to see, it says a pogrom against the Jews in New York. So this kind of vision that they're bringing anti-Semitism, uh, spreading anti-Semitism and Nazi doctrine in the United States. In the back, we see kind of a transformed Statue of Liberty with uh, holding up a, sw a swastika instead of this torch of freedom. Now this piece was done on September 13th, 1941, two days after Lindbergh delivered a speech in Des Moines, Iowa on September 11th, 1941, in which Lindbergh charged that there were three groups trying to push America into war, uh, the Roosevelt administration, the British and the Jews. 
And immediately Lindbergh was denounced by many for this, for this, this heinous statement. It became notorious uh, and got a lot of uh, criticism, including from people like Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, who was also working as a cartoonist at that time. But Schick, you could see early on, Schick adopted, uh, adapt, uh, adopted and adapted to his new homeland and began targeting people like, like Lindbergh. Gerald P. Nye was an important isolationist uh, senator. And you could see here that uh, Lindbergh, uh, that the Schick has portrayed him like Lindbergh as a Nazi peddling things like uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and various Nazi newspapers, including Der Sturmer, the, the notorious uh, anti, uh, anti-Jewish rag published by Julius Streicher. Now, the Nye had gained a reputation both for criticizing what the armaments, the munitions industries in the 1930s as being a, a promoter of war. But in, uh, he, in 1941, he attacked the film industry uh, and, per, and, 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 some, and for trying to push the United States into war. And he singled out people like Charlie Chaplin and the Hollywood uh, magnets for pushing films that he believed had an interversion, in, interventionist bent to them. Of course, this, you know, his comments identified uh, the heads of those studios as being Jewish. So what Schick is doing is uh, bringing up the anti-Semitism of both of these leaders. Now, it was uh, not only in his cartoons, but in some of this kind of a very colorful work. His work appeared in a lot of public, popular magazines, including Time, Collier's Look, and various others. And this is one that he did for a, a cover of Collier's. And what you probably can't see is kind of the all the intricate detail in here, but it's showing, for instance, Hitler holding up Mein Kampf. He has, he's holding a bloody dagger in which he has just stabbed the Soviet Union, so to speak, in the back. And you can see that the, the, the kind of death and destruction marked by the crosses in Europe that the Nazis have carried out. And you see also the suffering of the European peoples uh, in the background. And it also shows both death, uh, Satan, the, and as well as the Mussolini and a representative of, of Japanese militarism in this. Now, Schick, of course, adopted a lot of the uh, current anti-Japanese uh, stereotypes that were common in American cartooning and a lot of his work. And you can see that also the that Hitler is trampling uh, on democracy and and also, also the Bible. So that this is a notion of this kind of, that the anti-democratic, anti-Judeo-Christian uh, ethos of the Nazis. This is a, a piece that uh, he who rules by the sword. And if you, sometimes you can't see it, but there's often a lot of detail. If you look at Hitler's belt, in German it says, uh, Conscience is a Jewish invention, which was a, which was something that was attributed to Hitler. A uh, comment, and also there's a uh, comment in German that says to today uh, Europe, a kind of a, a, a parody on today Germany, tomorrow the world. And here he's saying showing that that uh, Europe is in Nazi hands. These, uh, this is a piece that was done for Look magazine, and this is part of a series of Nazi leaders that he did. And this, uh, uh, this is of Alfred Rosenberg. Now, Rosenberg was uh, perhaps the best known uh, uh, Nazi ideologue, uh, and he, you can see that he's carrying his magnum opus, the myth of the 20th century, uh, which which, which was widely published, but very rarely read, even by Nazi leaders. And you could see the kind of references that he makes to this, you know, in German, God punish 
Timoshenko, who was the uh, Soviet military leader. And even in here, you see the uh, kind of a detail on his sleeve is the Russian phrase, beat the Jews, which was a common th uh, thing in anti-Semitic circles dating back to the uh, uh, 19th century. This was another piece that Schick did. And it's kind of unusual because this is a, a, a sketch that, a, a drawing that he did of Reinhard Heydrich, who was the man responsible for carrying out, implementing the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe, the mass murder of Europe's Jews. But at the time Schick was working on it, uh, Heydrich was assassinated in Prague. And so he's crossed off the list and you can see that the, he's literally X'd out, eliminated uh, by Schick. Now Schick also did a lot of prominent advertising. This one is done uh, being promoted by uh, Young and Rubicom, which was a very prominent uh, uh, PR for Madison Avenue PR firm in New York. And this one is referring to the spread of kind of Nazi or Nazi-like rumors in the United States and how to combat those. And raising questions, you know, does this have the, the stink, the odor of Nazi propaganda? So Schick did a lot of different advertisements for, you know, uh, even Coca-Cola, he did, um, for all kinds of, uh, for things like uh, Philco and others. So Schick had, during the 1940s, a career that spanned not only the uh, cartoons and work for illustrating popular magazines, but advertisements. But uh, uh, one important uh, part of his 1940s work fighting Nazism was to, to call attention to the plight of Jewish suffering, and in particular, the mass murder of Europe's Jews. And Schick did that working with a group of people around Peter Bergson, Hillel Cook, who was a revisionist Zionist leader who came to the United States and did a lot of, created a number of organizations that were aimed first at, at at creating a Jewish army and then involved in rescue. They were very vocal and Schick became kind of the artist of this movement. And this was a cover that Schick did uh, for a, a pageant that was done uh, at Madison Square Garden and then later toured uh, around the United States. And it featured a lot of well-known Hollywood stars and it was to call attention to the, the, the murder, Nazi murder of 2 million Jews, which had been confirmed by the State Department in November of 1942. And the Bergson Group held this massive uh, memorial service to the 2 million Jews, but also to, ins uh, to inspire what they called action, not pity. That is, they didn't just want people to express sympathy for what was happening to the Jews, but to do something about it. And whether that was to support the creation of a Jewish army made up of stateless and Palestinian Jews that could fight against the Nazis. And you can see here a representative shown there. This is a pic, uh, a picture a drawing that was done called Tears of, of, of Rage. And it shows this, this Jewish soldier carrying a, uh, an American made submachine gun. And in his hands, he carries this kind of representative of the Jewish people, the wandering Jew. And if you look at the, the arm, it's wearing an armband like those that uh, the Nazis forced uh, Jews in the general government and occupied Poland to wear. And then you see the this kind of band, Nazi bayonet and that man's back. But you also it also conveys this this appeal and you can see that man with uh, with the shackles on appealing for aid. And you can see that in many ways Schick is conveying the notion that the Nazis, we're aiming to massacre all Jews, regardless of gender, age, uh, men, women, and children. And so Schick used 
his artwork and working with the Bergson Group to create full page ads and other things to draw attention to what was happening to the Jews and inspire action. This is a piece that he did with noted Hollywood uh, screenwriter Ben Hecht uh, called uh, The Ballad of the Doomed Jews of, of Europe. And the if you look at this kind of ornate drawing here, it's telling a story that, that works well with Hecht's, uh, Hecht's writing. And <clears throat> what you see, if you look at the bottom, you see, see that the Nazis are preparing to execute, to shoot Jews with a machine gun. The Jews are, are desperately calling out, for, calling out for help. And this is being passed up this kind of telephone line. And, and you see as you go up, the Jews are being hanged, you know, marked with the German uh, Jude. And it goes all the way up and you see the this, the phone not being answered by the United Nations. And so that the line is busy, no one's picking up this, this call for help. And in the background, you see an angel and death playing the four freedoms restricted. That is the notion that, that Roosevelt's four freedoms don't apply to the Jews. And so that this is one of those things that Hecht and Schick did in 1943. This is a four million Jews that are that are uh, at, that they believe were still alive at that time, that needed help, and that they were in danger of destruction. And so they were calling, uh, bringing this to to the world's attention to demand action. This is a, a, a piece that is called the Modern, uh, modern Moses, and it refers uh, to a biblical reference in the book of Exodus to the battle against the uh, uh, Amalekites, who were out to destroy the Jewish people as they made their way into their homeland. And it shows Moses in the centerpiece, surrounded by Aaron and her, uh, and this, the biblical story goes that, that Moses, when his arms were raised, the Jews were able to win in that fight. But when his arms went down, they lost. So this is kind of this symbolic triad uh, of them hold, helping Moses to raise his tired arms up to ensure uh, the, 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 uh, the survival and the victory of the Jewish people. And you can see that Schick has updated this. He used this image uh, frequently in, in his Haggadah and also in, in his Declaration uh, for the State of, um, Declaration of Independence for the State of Israel and other things. And so it, it had real meaning for him because it conveyed the notion that there's always an Amalek, an enemy of the Jews in every generation that must be combated. And you see this Jewish soldier there along with a Jewish worker doing their, their best on the front and on the home front to defeat the Nazis. This is an interesting piece that they also did on behalf of the Bergson Group. And this is shows in many ways the ways the way Schick and, and some other Jewish artists kind of reclaim Jesus for the Jewish people. That is showing Jesus as a Jew. You can see that in fact he carries this uh, insignia on the the uh, side of on the side of his cloak that says, you know, King of the Jews in German. And it's a, it's a reference to also the kind of comparing the suffering of Jesus to the suffering of the Jewish people. Now, uh, the, the reference to this, and this was used for ads for some of the Bergsonite groups, was that uh, it shows the convening of the United Nations in San Francisco. And it shows all these different national groups that are entering the halls uh, in, in San Francisco to take part in the founding of the United Nations. And then you have this comment from, from Jesus who, who says, you who speak uh, in my name, where are my people? 
And it's a reference to the fact that the United Nations at that time, um, there, were, uh, there were efforts made to have Jews as a, as a people represented in the United Nations, given what ha the suffering and the mass murder that occurred. And these were denied. And so Schick is using this as a way of attacking that, that the Jews have suffered so much in the war, they deserve to be represented as a people within the United Nations. Now, this is uh, a piece that I think you may find interesting. It is an incredibly detailed piece. Uh, like much of Schick's work, filled with all kinds of intricate and ornate uh, uh, references. And this is called uh, Walpurgisnacht, which ref references a a, 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 um, a kind of a German folklore myth about when witches uh, are kind of uh, unburden themselves and fly to a particular mountain in, in Germany. And so it's kind of the unleashing of these kind of unholy spirits. But it also has other references that I think are perhaps even more revealing. And I think that there's a link here to what we would say is uh, to, the, to the book of Revelation of the, the New Testament. And you might find this a kind of an odd thing for a Jewish artist to do, but it's, there are very clear references here. And it's also done in the style of uh, Albrecht Dürer the German uh, Renaissance artist who did these incredible etchings, you know, silver point and, you know, even elaborate woodcuts, often in some cases dealing with the, the apocalyptic themes. Uh, the Schick, for instance, uh, is re referencing those. And also there's, uh, I think, some elements of Hieronymus Bosch here. Now, what this refers to in my opinion, is a reference in the book of Revelation to kind of the fourth rider, the rider on a pale horse who represents death, that this is the fourth seal, you know, that the, it is death with Hades following, that is devil and hell following, and that the, that he comes, that death comes with a sword with hunger and the, and all kinds of beasts to destroy. And you can see the there are references that he's gonna wear a crown. There are also references in the uh the uh this this book of Revelation to the Antichrist. It's often used as kind of the basis for much of the um much of the much of the um uh, studies that have been done on the, the symbolism of the Antichrist. And you can see that the crown, for instance, which is, which is being held up is very much a part of the book of Revelation. And so you have here this kind of image of Hitler as death. And you could see that below you have representations of a dead, of a dead child, a dead Christian man, as well as a Jew holding on to the his sacred texts. And you could see a destroyed Europe in the background, along with masses of the population being beaten by the, by the SS, led into death and destruction. So these are, it's, there's so much intricacy in these. And even if you look at the belt that Hitler's wearing, it has the phrase in, in German, Deutschland über alles, uh, referring to this nationalist, uh, anthem that was popular in uh, both in the imperial time, but also in, in Nazi Germany. And so this is kind of one of those remarkable things that he did in, in 1942. Now, what I want you to think about is kind of the, the ways in which art uh, can inform viewers, can inform and change attitudes. Now, Hitler, uh, that Schick, firmly wanted to use his art to change people's opinions and behaviors. 
That is, he wanted them to be aware of what was happening, to encourage interventionism in support of the, the Allied cause. He believed very strongly in calling attention to what was happening to the Jews. That is, he was very motivated by using his art to push forward very positive agendas. And, and during the war years, he also talked about how after the war, he might use this to help uh, gain civil rights for African Americans. So he ver firmly believed that art could be a powerful tool in educating the population and using that to motivate people to change things for the better. So let me leave off there and I want to get to questions, which I'm looking forward to. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. That was uh, really a fully packed lecture about an artist that we had already the questions started coming in the very beginning. Um, do you actually want to close your... Um... Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, stop share. Okay. Exactly. All right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, wonderful. So, um, yeah, uh, one of the questions uh, that we received right in the beginning was where uh, uh, where he lived, and um, I, uh, from what I know, um, Schick was born in Poland and then was in uh, uh, in England working on his Hagada, on the publication of his Hagada and on an exhibition uh, when uh, the Nazis invaded Poland. So, uh, was he always kind of a step of uh, ahead of the war action or did uh, for example Canada and America accept him as a uh, as a European refugee well Schick was very fortunate enough he, uh, he made uh, even when he was living in England or in Paris he would make frequent trips back to his back to Poland his his brother and his mother still lived there. His father, by by uh, the time he became well known as an artist, had passed away, but he would visit his mother and and his brother. Both sadly died in the Holocaust. His mother, uh, both were deported to the Woods Ghetto, uh, and his mother was de deported to the Kelmo Killing Center when they had a roundup of children and elderly people and um and and so she sadly died his brother i think died the the following year uh so so schick had this great love for poland and he went back and forth but he was able to because he was doing so much work in paris and in london he essentially lived in those places but and then he left england to go to canada first and then in order to get to the United States. And then he probably became an American citizen, which was a big day. And he settled in New Canaan, Connecticut, which became his home. And I uh, actually went to, to New Canaan to see where he lived and to talk to some of his neighbors who, who knew him, which was quite, you know, gave you another perspective on this, this man. He was one of the, when, when they, he and Julia uh, moved to, to New Canaan, they were one of the first Jewish families that that moved in there. So it was kind of a remarkable story. But Sheik always seemed to be, you know, in the right place at the right time for his artwork. But he never he never lost his uh, uh, love for for Poland. He would he, he wasn't an uncritical uh, supporter of everything the Polish government did, but he was somebody who kept very much. Uh, abreast of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the question is uh, whether he had a connection. Renata Stee is, uh, is asking uh, whether there was a connection to George Gross. Uh, that I I haven't seen any references that that uh, that. Schick knew George Gross. George Gross, of course, came to the United States uh, even, I think, slightly before the Nazis came to power. And of course, the Nazis would have uh, imprisoned him right away for his biting uh, commentary. And then Gross eventually went back to Germany after the war. But I, as far as I know, there wasn't any um, 
contact between them. Um, uh, Schick had contact with, with other artists, but primarily, I think, from either American or, or, uh, or Eastern European Jewish artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, comparison of uh, uh, George Goes coming up, I find very interesting because one of the things that strikes me uh, about uh, Sheik is that he was really, as a refugee, as an immigrant to America, that he was able to find a visual language that reached the American people, while George Goes somehow, and I think that was one of the main reasons why he uh, went back to Germany. He was never able to really connect to the uh, to the American public. He never had the successes with his uh, artwork um, in America that he did back in in Germany. So, and they both, you know. Um, uh, do a lot. They both used caricature and were highly critical of Nazism. So um, I I wonder what Schick did right, like how he connect, how he was able to connect to the American people, and uh, in comparison, especially to George Bush. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's Schick in many ways was quick to, I think, to adapt to new circumstances. You know, and to to create things in a in an American medium, mm -hmm. in a, an American me uh, idiom, mm -hmm. so that he could reach a large number of people. I think Gross, you know, um, remarkable artist. You know, whose work mm -hmm. I love. You know, both you know satirized and attacked German militarism. You know, gross, and actually at the same time, even you know, you look at some of Schick's early works, you know, from around the the, the First World War and after, German militarism uh, is is very much a part of his, you know, uh, his attacks. But I think you're right. I, I think George Gross never found that kind of home. They never kind of found an atmosphere that was conducive for success like he found in Berlin. You know, and and and, and I, it's it's hard to know why that was, but you know, it's kind of a sad. Uh, it's it's very sad in some respects. Although Gross continued to do some anti-Nazi uh, work in the United States. Yeah, right, right. So uh, Miriam Cohn asked whether uh, cartoons published in the Yiddish press as well. There were some things, interestingly enough, there was a, uh, one of the first biographies of Schick was done by an S.L. Schneiderman, who was a prominent Yiddish uh, journalist who wrote for the Vorwärts and others. And so Schick's, um, Schick's um, I'm trying to think of uh, offhand, like you, sometimes uh, you also see references to Schick's work in, um, the more, uh, also another leftist one, Morgan Journal, um, in the Yiddish press, and certainly there, there are. He was covered in the Yiddish press. He was um, there was a. He was actually also res involved in efforts to create, actually one of the first Holocaust memorials in the United States that didn't really take off. But at that time, but he was very active in it, also in designing some things for commemorations of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So there was an interest in the Yiddish press for Schick's work, and some of his work appeared in that. Uh, also, his work in the 1930s appeared in uh, the Polish language newspapers in Poland before the Nazi takeover. Mm -hmm. Um, so Kirwan asks, um, during the war, did the US government, for example, the Office of War Information, used Schick's work as propaganda? I haven't. Uh, certainly there were things that, um, I'm trying to think of offhand if the Office of War Information used Schick's work. There were a lot of things that appeared more in like popular, um, in like the popular press in the New York Post and PM, Chicago Sun in newspapers like that, but also Esquire magazine promote, they did a lot of promotion of his, of his work. I'm not sure if I'd, I'd have to 
check to see if the if the office the OWI specifically used any of Schick's work. Um, certainly, they had you know many artists you know from Ben Shan to to others that were active in in uh, in in the in the war effort there. But it's a very good question. Yeah. Um, Susan Schender asked whether Schick feel he was successful at some level. Yeah, I think he did. I think he did very well in those in those years in the uh, in the nineteen you know thirties and forties. You know, he was. I mean, his work in the forties reached millions of people, mm -hmm. and uh, so he was always he was always in demand. Um, I think. After the war ended, he continued to illustrate Jewish books, but then he passed away kind of prematurely in 1951. And then I think he kind of fell from, uh, fell from popularity. And there was really nobody to, to kind of, no school that he had set up, no, no uh, students that followed his path. And so a lot of, uh, he kind of fell into obscurity. And then eventually, you know, it's his interest in Schick started to, you know, started to pick up. And people started saying, hey, who was this guy, you know? And he, he was, his work, you know, could be seen all over. You know, we went to uh, a number of different, you know, museums around the, the United States and you'd find Schick's works and they're from the Metropolitan Museum of Art to the Jewish Museum in New York to, uh, um, uh, you know, to our museum, to the, the U.S. Naval Academy, the U.S. Marine Corps Museum, just so many places that you find Schick's work and, uh, you know, but much of it had been kind of, you know, not really used or promoted until more recent years. Yeah, I mean, he has a very specific uh, visual language. It's, uh, you know, you don't need to uh, be a specialist in art to recognize a shake. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, I want to backpedal a little bit um, uh, to his early um, training because uh, Karl Newland asked uh, about the Walpurgisnacht whether this is indeed an act, uh, an, indeed an action uh, that uh, etching that work. Um, so uh, uh, is it first of all is it an etching or actually it's not. It's not. I think it's done with pen, pencil, and ink. Uh, and so it's not an, it looks like an etching, right. but it's not, you know, but it's clearly done in that style. Schick was, Schick was very good at kind of imitating and drawing on the past. He, you know, um, and also, you know, as for, I think he had, you know, in his library, all kinds of art books, as well as books that detail things on uniforms and all of that historically. So he would use them so that, so that there was a certain accuracy in the way he portrayed the past. And you kind of see the, and you also see the kind of development of Schick, you know, kind of from going, at least in his Jewish art, from kind of this Orientalist uh, art to uh, a more distinctively Schick uh, presentation, mm -hmm. but you know we we um, we had a number of the original plates from the his Haggadah that were done in the '30s, and when it, when he was first working on it, he told the press that he was going to include references to the Nazis. Mm -hmm. that he was going to depict them so that it was a clear contemporary reference. And that, of course, caused, was a, a, a source of some concern from the publishers of this who didn't want to get into anything overtly political. And so, you know, and, and Chick had promised to paint swastikas on this. So we, when we were, had these pieces, we said, let's see if we could find any of these that remained because he, he painted over these. You can see on some of the Egyptians, they had armbands and there were swastikas. But we found one swastika. Our conservator was looking at it with a microscope and found one swastika that he hadn't <laughs> he hadn't expunged or covered. 
<laughs> it up. And uh, but so that was kind of like, he, he really did it, you know? And with the, that film Cartoon Crusader um, showed us that when he was doing the illustrations for the Book of Job, he put swastikas on some of the villains there. Mm -hmm. And then he had to change that. But you could see in the film, they were there. When the published book was done, they were absent. Yeah. So that he had to, again, adjust to the sensibilities of, of publishers and all that. But just a remarkable uh, artist. Yeah, but uh, I, I saw the uh, this image of the four sons where, you know, one of them is wearing a... a Bavarian uh, leather pants, and um, so he has these references. You just have to look very uh, close. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, and that 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 you know, it's this the the kind of wicked son, and he's got like a Hitler mustache, and he's got a swastika pin, and this was something that Chick felt, you know, he was critical in some ways of German Jews. Uh, who he said, you know, felt that they were more German than Jewish and that they had, you know, tried to ad adopt the, the mannerisms and the, the nationalism and that had backfired. And so he saw that as a kind of a bad, a bad omen. Um, and so, and he saw himself very much as a proud Jew and was never afraid of identifying himself as, as being Jewish. And uh, so for him, that was, you know, this kind of denial or what he saw, saw as kind of assimilation, assimilationism uh, he frowned upon. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that there was a big, uh, big move and movement in, in a German jewelry, that's, that's for sure. Um, so now uh, Alisa Rosenberg asks uh, what a chic Haggadah is worth. Like, are there, is there still, I think there's a new edition out, right? Um, yeah, um, are there copies of the still existent uh, of the old original? Yeah, the, the, the original ones, there's still copies of, it was printed in a very limited edition and on vellum. And uh, those are still, still out there, but there's a relatively small number of those. And so they're, they're still valuable. I don't know what the, the current cost of those. I know that Irvin Unger, Rabbi Irvin Unger, who has been a, I think a, a one man army and, and kind of uh, pr and promoting uh, Arthur Schick's work, did a, a wonderful uh, uh, new version of, of this Haggadah with, based on the original play, you know, the original, um, uh, artwork. And I think that it really brings out a lot of the details. The original uh, version, very, it was seen as, you know, one of the most spectacular books published at that time. Uh, but I think, you know, when you compare it to the originals, the original work that Schick did, uh, there's no comparison, just in slight and day. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, Kendra Lee Adams says, brilliant man, there's nothing bigger than uh, what? <laughs> no, that's something. Cold cook. <laughs> and some, something, something very unrelated. Um, uh, coming back, do you, do you think Schicks was uh, uh, influenced by um, by illuminations? By early, did did how? Where did he learn his craft? Because, uh, um, or was he self-taught? Well, I think uh, Czech, you know, when he was in Paris, he studied, you know, fr from some of these illuminated manuscripts, you know, and, and learned from that, you know, the ways, I mean, if you, if you, just the, the, um, the approach that he took, and you see, sometimes these images are tiny, mm -hmm. and he had this magnifying glass that he would use, and just, you know, with those brushes, do this very detailed work, and uh, the, uh, but he, he'd learned from a lot of different things. Schick was, I think, always learning. And I think, you know, he picked up on from the, these illuminated manuscripts. And I think was, uh, uh, you know, and, um, and Persian miniatures and all kinds of different art. You know, he was, uh, he was an avid 
adaptive learner and, and, and was able to, I think, adapt those kind of styles to what he was doing. Right, right. So in the meantime, we got an answer from Greg Philipson that the original Haggadah goes for about forty to fifty thousand uh, dollars. So that's great information. Thank you so much. Uh, and Irving Oster says, uh, "Thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I really appreciate your linking his work to his contemporaries as well, especially Dura." Could you talk more about how his daughter helped you with your research? Does he have any descendants? Uh, so sad that he died so young. Yeah, um, Alexandra was a, a remarkable uh, person in so many ways. I just, you know, like I would ask her, we would just talk about him and she'd say, okay, you know, I'd say, I'd say well, he did all these cartoons, you know, what did, what did he use? You know, she said, oh, he, you know, if there was, you know, a board from, you know, the laundry for a pressed shirt, he would write on that or any piece of paper. And you can see that in some of these, you know, piece of notebook paper that he scribbles on, he scribbled on, you know, the, you know, how the, it was to be cropped and the dimensions for how it was going to appear in the newspaper and all of that. And so there were instructions on some of these, but you could see the ways in which he toyed around with, with different things. And, and I remember she would say, oh, he used to sing this song, you know, about bubbles, you know, and just, you know, it, she gave kind of a new life to, to him that, you know, brought a kind of a human perspective to it. And, you know, the work that, you know, the life that he had with, with Julia, his mother, the difficulties the family faced after his death, because he was the breadwinner. Right. And so, you know, once once all those, those things started um, disappearing, those contracts, you know, the family had to sell off some of the artwork, you know, in order to, to live. And uh, so, the, uh, so there were auctions of his, his work at the time, but she just, you know, she was just so full of life, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, her, her donation to the museum was just, you know, uh, uh, you know, just remarkable. We even got, uh, at the time we got Art Spiegelman to do, uh, you know, who from the New Yorker, who was also inspired by Schick's work. And he did a kind of, um, uh, an audio tour for us talking a little bit about Schick, along with Alexandra talking about the, about her father. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, and, and we did uh, some work with other cartoonists, you know, um, who talked about, about the impact that Schick had on them, uh -huh. you know, as a, as a kind of cartooning style. And so it was, it was very nice to hear, you know, that he wasn't, that he wasn't forgotten by people, that he did inspire others after him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that it was very nice to hear, or do, or do people say, you know, oh, I remember we had a, um, you know, pathways through the Bible that Schick illustrated, you know, when we were growing up, or we had his Anderson's fairy tales, or we had something, you know, uh, that he illustrated in their in their household when they were growing up. And so it's it's nice to hear that you know that people kept those and retained those, and they had you know cherished memories associated with his work. Right, right, and um, yeah, I also find it really interesting that he uh, did not stay with the political art, uh, that he was a political artist when he felt like his voice was needed for a certain, you know, for the defeat of the Nazis really, and for people to understand uh, what the Nazis were and what they did, uh, but that he afterwards uh, stopped this political art and, and found uh, different topics that were equally important to him or uh, even more important, or maybe you uh, return to the topics that uh, uh, originally interested him. I don't know how to best put, put it. How would you put that? I think it was, in some ways, it was hard to separate some of the politics from Schick's art, even for him. You know, even, uh, uh, the last book of Esther that he did um, towards the end of his life, there's the last, one of the, the, the last pieces on that shows Haman 
Haman hanging from the gallows and he's bedecked in all kinds of swastikas. And it shows Schick mm-hmm. there at a, at a table eating, you know, a piece of hamantaschen. Mm-hmm. You know, which I thought was a, an interesting way of for him to celebrate Purim, you know, the, to have this. But it was a reminder of what had happened, you know, this almost um, um, complete extinction of the Jewish people in Europe, that he, it's this constant reminder. Mm-hmm. Right. So the people don't forget that. And then in some ways that was kind of in keeping with I think a lot of the, even a lot of the survivors from that time is that you don't forget what happened, that it's important to remember. And I think Schick was very much a part of that generation. He fought very strongly to have a, for a Jewish state in Israel. Mm -hmm. And so that that was, that was a, a cause dear to his heart. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, things for, you know, uh, civil rights and other things, you know, there were things, and just being proud to be an American. He did a lot of things to promote, you know, the United States and, and, um, and the United Nations. And so there were th- a lot of things that were very dear to his heart that he devoted his heart to. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, this uh, I learned so much, and I, you know, I want to kind of uh, I want to conclude with a quote from Elie Wiesel, who once said, "We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented." So, and I find it amazing how the artist. Uh, Arthur Schick took sides, the Bergson group also uh, called for action. And with his example, um, I think Arthur Schick also calls us to, uh, calls on us to take sides as well, uh, which we uh, have plenty of reasons in uh, today's world. So thank you so much. And um, I uh, will send out a follow-up email. We recorded this. Um, event and you will receive a link to the recording uh be well everybody and stay in touch and goodbye thank you thank you very much thank you